and services without you. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and just as a reminder, you are listening to Words on Film on BostonFreeRadio.com and WBCA, watching me on Somerville Community Access TV or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you as always. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I've got three new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, I'm going to get to my normal segment, which is... What's topping the box office for July 31st, 2018? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Some of them are hits, a few are flops, but I'll let you know the difference as I go through them. And number one at the box office this week is probably no surprise to those of you who have been paying attention. Number one movie at the box office is Mission Impossible Fallout, one of the three movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show. This weekend it grossed $61.2 million in the United States and $155 $5.8 million worldwide against a budget of $178 million, which means that it's neither a hit yet here in the States or around the world, and just because it's number one at the box office in a given week does not automatically make it make it a hit, but it's off to a really good start and should be at least a tentative hit internationally by next week. Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again was number two at the box office last week, and it's number two at the box office this week, having grossed $15.1 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $75 million, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again has grossed $70.5, that's $70.5 million at the U.S. box office so far, and internationally it has grossed $167.9 million, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. So very good for Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. The Equalizer 2 uh, was number one at the box office last week, and it fell below Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again in its second week in release. Remember, they were both released at the same time, so that's actually kind of hard to believe. But this weekend, The Equalizer 2 grossed $14 million even. Against a budget of $62 million, though, The Equalizer 2 has so far grossed $64.3 million at the U.S. box office and $70.4 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit both here in the States and around the world, so it's showing some promise. Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation is number four at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week in its third week in release, having grossed $12.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $80 $80 million, that's $80 million. Hotel Transylvania 3 has so far grossed $119.2 million here in the States and $285 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit all around the world. And it could be actually a certified hit in the next couple of weeks, but probably not by next week, at least here in the States. Teen Titans Go to the Movies is number five at the box office this weekend, falling a little short of expectations in its debut week. And it grossed $10.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend, $11.5 million at box offices worldwide, and that is against a budget of $10 million. So while it was not off to a great start, it actually has a lower budget than most other animated films, and it is already a tentative hit here in the States and around the world with a very good chance of becoming certified in both places by next week. Of course, we will have to see. Ant-Man and the Wasp is a movie that's in its fourth week in release, and it's falling surprisingly quickly. Last week it was number four at the box office, this weekend it's number six, having grossed $8.8 million at the U.S. box office so far, or this past weekend. Against a budget of $162 million, Ant-Man and the Wasp has so far grossed $183.5 million here in the States, and $395.7 million worldwide. So it's not gross 
grossing nearly as much money as either Black Panther or Avengers Infinity War have done so far. That's And those two are the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies that have come before Ant-Man and the Wasp. And it doesn't look like it's going to gross anywhere near those, either here in the States or worldwide. But still, it's doing pretty well for itself, being a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit around the world. Incredibles 2 is also doing extremely well in its seventh week in release, having grossed $7.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend, dropping from number five last week to number seven this week. Against a budget of $200 million, The Incredibles 2 has so far grossed $572.9 million here in the States and $1.24 billion worldwide, making almost as much as Black Panther has so far. In fact, it may exceed Black Panther in gross, but either way, it is a certified hit here in the States and worldwide and is another surefire winner for the Walt Disney Company. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is not doing especially well here in the States, but is actually doing pretty well worldwide. I'll tell you exactly what those numbers are. Uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom grossed $6.7 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend and a correction on the international gross. But first, let me tell you what it's, it's grossed so far here in the States. Against a budget ranging from 170 to $187 million, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom has so far grossed $397.5 million here in the States and $1.24 billion worldwide. That was my mistake. It was Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom that grossed $1.24 billion, not Incredibles 2. That grossed $999.3 million, which means it's still a big winner for the Walt Disney Disney Company, but it's not quite a billion dollars yet, but rest assured by next week it will be. But as for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, it just eked its way to being a certified hit here in the States, and it's already been a certified hit around the world, rest assured. Skyscraper, starring Dwayne Johnson, took a big drop from number six last week to number nine this week, having grossed $5.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from $125 to $129 million, Skyscraper has so far grossed $59.1 million here in the States, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States. And around the world, it has actually grossed one, excuse me, $256 million. So while it's not a hit yet here in the States and may not be, it it is a certified hit worldwide, which happens sometimes. And finally, number 10 at the box office, The First Purge. It grossed $2.2 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $13 million, it grossed $65.5 million here in the States and $111.1 .1 million worldwide, making it a certified hit in both arenas. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Mission Impossible Fallout, which is the sixth, if you can believe it, Mission Impossible movie total, and that is over the span of 22 years. And this time we have Christopher McQuarrie, who is returning after having written, produced, and directed the previous Mission Impossible film, which was Rogue Nation, which came out during the summer of 2015. And now he's back, along with, of course, it doesn't re- you don't really have to guess, Tom Cruise reprising his role as Ethan Hunt. A number of other people from the previous Mission Impossible films make their return, including Ving Rhames, who has actually been with the Mission Impossible series from the very beginning, and he's at least made a cameo appearance in every film from from what I can gather. He returns as Luther Stickle. Simon Pegg returns as Benji Dunn, who made his debut in the fourth Mission Impossible movie, Ghost Protocol, which is actually my personal favorite amongst all of them. Also, you have Alec Baldwin returning, as well as Michelle Monaghan. And the new cast members include Henry Cavill, best known for playing Superman in three of the... DC Cinematic Universe movies, which have been hit or miss, but here he plays CIA agent August Walker, and we also have Angela Bassett um, making her Mission Impossible debut. It's her first appearance, but not her last appearance, as FBI Federal Agent Erica Sloan, who actually assigns August Walker, Henry Henry Cavill's character, to oversee Ethan Hunt in his mission to track down stolen plutonium from a group of international terrorists who call themselves the Apostles. So we got a really good setup for a spy thriller here, and it takes place two years after the capture of a terrorist by the name of Solomon Lane, who's played by Sean Harris. And Solomon Lane was a member of an organization called the Syndicate, which kind of disbanded but has reformed into a terrorist group known as the Apostles. And the Apostles are to the syndicate what ISIS is to Al-Qaeda, even though, kind of like Al-Qaeda, the syndicate hasn't exactly broken up. They've certainly been weakened, and of course ISIS formed as a result of the... uh, I I don't want to get too much into terrorist history, but... ISIS formed as a result of the attacks on, the deserved attacks on Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda still hasn't broken up, but they're still out there. So, anyway, the movie begins with Ethan Hunt being found in Belfast, and he's given his mission, should he choose to accept it, of obtaining three plutonium cores, which are being held by another terrorist organization. He eventually goes to Berlin where he meets up with Benji Dunn, who's played by Simon Pegg, and Luther Stickle, played by Ving Rhames, but ultimately their mission fails. How their mission fails, I'm not going to be able to tell you, but as a result of this, Erica Sloan, who is the director of the CIA in this movie, who's played by Angela Bassett, instructs Special Activities Operative August Walker, played by Henry Cavill, to shadow hunt or supervise him as he attempts to retrieve the plutonium. So it's a really good setup for a story, and of course you have Alec Baldwin as Alan Hunley, who's the secretary of IMF, which is the, the fictional agency for which... Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, works. And, of course, Alec Baldwin in this movie plays who he normally plays in dramas nowadays. In other words, he is the guy who yells at the protagonist. He's on the protagonist's side, but, of course, he will let the protagonist know when a mission goes wrong and when he really screws up. So there is a lot going on in Mission Impossible Fallout, but... Continuing with the trend that began with Ghost Protocol and continuing on to this movie, it's not too confusing, and it's not Tom Cruise like in the uh, the movie Mission Impossible 2. It's not him showing off or posing for the camera. And actually, as I look back on 
the first two Mission Impossible movies. I won't make any comment on the third Mission Impossible movie because that's actually the only one I haven't seen. But from what I gather from other critics and other people who have seen the movie, I'm really not missing much. But the first two movies had a number of weaknesses for which, oddly enough, the last three movies that have come out, including Mission Impossible Fallout, have actually improved upon as the series progresses. And initially I had my misgivings going going into Mission Impossible Fallout. It, It is, after all, the sixth movie in the franchise. Which means that usually by number five or number six, the franchise burns out. But interestingly enough, it may be that either Christopher McQuarrie, who directed the this movie and the last film, and maybe even Simon Pegg, who has been in the last three films, might have been the unsung heroes of the Mission Impossible series. Because since both of them have latched onto Mission Impossible... It really hasn't shown any signs of slowing down, but also kudos has to be given to Tom Cruise, who, despite his uh, controversies with his personal life and, of course, his dealings with the Church of Scientology, which is really beginning to show its cracks, he still shows that he can bring in a crowd and also really make a convincing leading man still in an action film at the age of 55. I'm in fact jealous of him because I'm 35 and I look older than Tom Cruise. It's so unfair. It really is. But truth be told, Tom Cruise still knows how to make a great movie. He knows how to make a great action film. And he's not the only strength of this movie, but all the supporting players from, as I said, Simon Pegg to Ving Rhames to Michelle Monaghan, they all do well in this role. And I also was really impressed with Henry Cavill in this film. And a lot of people might have misgivings about this movie, especially given the fact that Henry Cavill has kind of botched his reputation by playing Superman, or at least playing it the way he has, but to Henry Cavill's credit, he's not the only reason that the DC Cinematic Universe has hit the ground stumbling, but he hasn't quite helped either. But here he's actually found his footing and probably has had his best role to date, and that's saying a lot considering his roles as Superman and also the forgettable Man from Uncle. But Mission Impossible Fallout is an exciting film, it shows no signs of slowing down, and it gets my rating of a knockout because this film is so fun to watch. It has an amazing climax at the end, which I won't give away, and I highly recommend this film as well as the next imagine if i told you that an earthquake was going to hit tomorrow right where you live that it would be 6.5 in magnitude with aftershocks occurring twice 25 minutes apart you'd no doubt talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today it's true i can't tell you an earthquake will happen tomorrow but what if it does shouldn't you have a plan Visit lacounty.gov slash emergency and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Emergency Management, FEMA, and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society. Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Why did I hesitate between, why did I pause between the words go and to? Well, because Teen Titans Go to the Movies is based on a very popular Cartoon Network series called Teen Titans Go, which is in turn based on another 
another animated series that aired on the WB, the what uh, one half of what CW used to be, in from 2003 to 2006. And since Teen Titans Go premiered on Cartoon Network five years ago, it has been a pretty big hit. So I went into this movie not. I of course I'm familiar with some of the characters in the film, like Robin, of course, the sidekick to Batman, and of course Cyborg is one of the members of the Justice League, but I actually wasn't entirely familiar with either the TV series or actually the, the series of comic books. And truth be told, actually Teen Titans is a comic book that dates back to the 60s, interestingly enough. So it premiered quite a while after... Um, you know, the original Batman and Superman comic books, but it had somewhat of an underground following. And I am not familiar with the comic books, and I haven't seen either of the cartoon series, but of course, it's one of those cartoon shows like Adventure Time or Rick and Morty that not only has a big following with kids, but it also has probably an equal amount of following with adults. And Teen Titans Go, from my understanding of it, and also from watching this movie is very quirky and self-referential. Basically, it's Robin and these other four um, <laughs> cartoon characters. I'll, I'll tell you what, who the heroes are in, in case you're not sure. There's Robin, who in this movie is voiced by Scott Menville, as, as he is in the TV series. In fact, all the pr primary characters are voiced by the same character or the same actors as in the TV series. So Robin is voiced by Scott Menville. Beast Boy is this green creature who can turn into just about any animal he wants to. He's voiced by Greg Sipes. You have Cyborg, who is a human that's made out of robotic parts, and he's voiced by Carrie Payton. You have Raven, who is this goth girl who also is able to create portals from which for which the team can travel from one place to another. She's voiced by Tara Strong. And finally, you have Starfire, who's another female member of the group. And to be completely honest with you, I'm not sure exactly what it is that Starfire does. I know she can fly, but I that that's just about all it seems like she can do. But either way, I, I guess she's an interesting character personality-wise, and I mean that in the least patronizing way as possible. But in any event, the Teen Titans are occupied or are the resident heroes in Jump City, which is a city that's adjacent to Gotham, and they fight crime for the city, including taking on villains like Balloon Man. But the problem is that they're not as respected or taken as seriously as other DC comic characters like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern, all of whom, by the way, make cameos in this film. As a matter of fact, if you know nothing about DC comics, this is probably this movie is probably the best place to start because it actually has cameos from virtually every DC comic books character ever created, or at least the superheroes. In fact, there is a running gag with this group called Challengers of the Unknown, which was an obscure DC Comics uh DC combo characters that probably haven't been around since the 70s. I had not heard of these characters before watching this film. But either way, so the the Teen Titans are discouraged because just about every superhero has their own movie except them. And Robin in particular is probably the most eager to get a movie made out of him. And at first they consult a a direct or uh, yeah, a movie director whose name is Jade Wilson, who's played by Kristen Bell, but she's not interested in making a movie about them because there are so many other superheroes out there that have more interesting backstories. And the one thing that the Teen Titans find they need is an arch villain. And they find one in a supervillain named Slade, who's voiced in this movie by Will Arnett. And Slade is 
actually a, a villain who goes by Slade in this movie, but he's also known in the comic books as Deathstroke. And he is a character who the Teen Titans will ultimately remind you looks a lot like Deathpool. Although Slade in this movie is voiced by Will Arnett, will tell you that he came before Deadpool. Whether or not that's true, I don't exactly know. But in any event, Teen Titans Go was not a movie I had high expectations for. As I said, I'm not familiar with the 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 comic or even the TV series on which it's based. But I did have a good time watching this film and I laughed a lot. I only have basic a basic knowledge of the major DC superheroes, but I liked how this movie just said to hell with it and just lambasted each and every one of them. I, I really liked that. And I also like the fact that there are some surprising voice actors who make appearances in this film. Like, for instance, Superman is voiced by Nicolas Cage and, might I add, voiced very well. And interestingly enough, a lot of people don't know this, but Nicolas Cage almost played Superman. He... This was an incantation of Superman that was going to star Nicolas Cage as the titular hero and be directed by Tim Burton. And it's known as one of the greatest films never made. And I think Nicolas Cage being in this movie kind of compensates for that. But Teen Titans Go! is a pretty good movie to see if you're a fan of Teen Titans Go! I don't think anybody will be disappointed. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more backstory for those people who weren't as familiar with these characters. But at the same time, this movie did avoid the trappings of an origin story. And maybe even they could have a parody of an origin story after this film. And I'd like to see a sequel of this. And T-Titans Go to the Movies gets my rating of a knockout. It does get a little formulaic at times. And sometimes the self-referential humor gets a little over the top, probably even more so than the original Deadpool. But I did enjoy this movie. I laughed a lot more than I did either Deadpool movie. And I recommend it. Tómese un minuto para averiguar si podría tener prediabetes. Visite podriatenerprediabetes.org Pero seguramente no lo va a hacer porque hay mil excusas. Los niños, el trabajo, no tiene tiempo. Pero no se preocupe. Estar ocupado previene la prediabetes. <laughs> claro que no. Cualquiera puede padecer prediabetes. Hasta los más ocupados. Visite podriatenerprediabetes.org No hay excusas. La prediabetes es reversible. Presentado por el Ad Council y sus socios de la campaña educativa sobre la prediabetes. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on bostonfreeradio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film. The Spoken Word Show, dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Unfriendly Dark Web. This is marketed as being a, a, a sequel to Unfriended, which came out in... 2014. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but it's not actually. It's more like a spin-off. As a matter of fact, one of the most disappointing things about Unfriended Dark Web is that other than the fact that it's sort of a found footage movie that takes place entirely on the desktop of a computer and you only see the characters from their Skype cameras, that's really about it. There's no real paranoia or rather paranormal there's there is some paranoia in this movie but there's no paranormal paranormal entity that takes these protagonists by surprise but it's a movie about a teen who comes in possession of a new laptop which he claims to have bought from craigslist and he soon discovers that the previous owner is not only watching him but will also do anything to get it back so Unfriended was about the, the the original Unfriended from 2014 involved the spirit of a dead teenager who was haunting the spirits of those teenagers she claimed had cost her life. So there was a paranormal aspect to that film. Here, it's just about a disgruntled hacker who wants his laptop back. So... The protagonist of this film is a gentleman by the name of 
Matthias, and he's playing this movie by Colin Waddell. And this movie makes you think that this is a movie about teenagers, but to me, they actually looked like college students. In fact, Colin Waddell was born in 1991, which makes him 27 years old. So he is not even passable as a teenager. He looks like a college student, as does all the people who interact with him in this movie. In fact, probably the movie that gets this film up to the off to a pretty good start, at least a heartfelt start, is when he is interacting with his girlfriend on the web, and his girlfriend is deaf. Her name is... Hang on. I'm I'm getting to it. It's just my computer's a little slow. Her name is Serena, and she's played by Rebecca Rittenhouse. And they actually communicate on Skype by way of sign language. In fact, I actually thought that the the part where Matthias is act or Matthias is creating a software program to better communicate with his deaf girlfriend was kind of sweet. What 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 he would do is he would create a program that would type in words and then he would show a montage of these of of these words being translated into sign language. It looks actually a little clunky, but the the sentiment is there. But in any event, so trouble starts happening when he creates a live group chat, chat with several of his friends, and this disgruntled hacker who wants his laptop back is threatening to off his friends one by one until he gets that laptop back. And sure enough, Eventually, Matthias is drawn into a literal dark web of, well, not only deceit, but also of an underground part of the internet that's not part of the World Wide Web, which at first is a little chilling, but eventually the movie just kind of runs dry when you kind of think to yourself, okay, it would be one thing if this were a paranormal entity who is threatening to kill somebody if they sign off, but then again... This guy in the movie, it's a little bit of a twist, but not too much of a spoiler. You realize he stole the laptop from this guy. Not in- intentionally, but he was trying to create this program, and he needed a better computer on which to do that. So he takes a laptop from the lost and found of the uh, YMCA, which he works at, or some kind of community center like that. And apparently this laptop had been there for quite some time, which is kind of odd because laptops don't last very long, long in the lost and found. First of all, the person who lost the laptop will probably go back to the place immediately and retrieve it. Or two, failing that, somebody will steal it immediately. I don't think the shelf life of a laptop in a lost and found would probably be any more than 24 hours. Maybe it would be 24 hours if the person who lost it was lucky. But in any event, after that setup, the movie just kind of drags afterwards. And eventually I found myself not really caring for the protagonists in this film. Not because they don't act well, and not because they don't... Uh, invite or earn my sympathies, but just because eventually the movie gets really, really boring. And uh, even though I wasn't the biggest fan of the movie Unfriended from four years ago, that movie wasn't boring. In fact, the, the, the end of the movie had a really validly good jump scare. But this movie doesn't really have the jump scares. Eventually, it just kind of ends and it sort of peters out rather than having even one good jump scare or even a a sense of eeriness as the film progresses. And the original Unfriended had a theme that was a lot of people thought that if this person really wanted to save herself, why didn't she just shut off the laptop? Well, that was the point of the movie. That people are so addicted to the web these days, certain people, that it becomes harder to turn the the laptop off. But here, it just seems like a more plausible thing to do would be for this guy to to as soon as this guy as this other person who claims he owns the laptop tells him he wants to return it, shut the laptop off, return it to the guy. 
It's not hard. If it was a paranormal entity who was threatening your life, if you if you turned it off, that would be one thing. But unfortunately, this movie doesn't really go beyond that creative point. The movie has some very interesting characters, particularly the friends of Mateus. And, uh, of course, I, I liked hearing some of them. But, of course, I just didn't really buy how this movie fleshed itself out. I didn't really... I, I thought the plot was incredibly ridiculous when it could have been solved really easily and when you have allegedly smart people in in a film like this doing really dumb things like not returning a laptop to somebody when they specifically ask for it it just kind of throws the plausibility of this movie right out the window so this movie gets a high flunk out to me but still a flunk out nonetheless it's not an enjoyable film it's not a thrilling film it's just kind of blah Whoa. The moment my son saw a redwood tree. It's huge! Is the moment I knew that for him. You can't even see the top of that thing! Even the sky has no limit. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Learn about forests near you and discover cool things to do when you go. Your moment is out there. Find it at discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Boston Free Boston Radio. 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 Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. So I've only reviewed, or I've only seen three movies for which to review for you for this show, which is kind of unfortunate because I try to do five maximum, or, you know, four on a bad week. But I had a really busy weekend, and I should stop apologizing. But usually when I run out of films to review, I usually give you my take on films that are coming out on DVD and Blu-ray today, and maybe stream if you know at all possible but one of the big films that's coming out on dvd today is the remake of overboard which i saw when it came out in theaters and i was actually more impressed by it than i thought i'd be so the remake of overboard stars anna ferris and eugenio derbez and Eugenio Derbez plays one of Mexico's richest playboys who crosses path with a working class single mom played by Anna Ferris. And one day he's driving on or he's riding on his yacht, you know, doing playboy things. He falls off the the edge of the yacht and washes up on shore of the coastal town where Anna Ferris's character lives and has no memory of who he was. Anna Ferris takes advantage of that by convincing Eugenio Derbez that he is her husband and that he actually works for a living. So it's a movie I didn't think worked because I've seen Eugenio Derbez in How to Be a Latin Lover and even though I kind of appreciated his comedic style i didn't like that movie because it was such a bad premise but i laughed at eugenio derbez in this movie a lot and i did think that he and anna ferris had a unique kind of chemistry i did think that anna ferris fell a little bit into um goldie hahn imitation uh but then again in this remake of overboard the genders are switched in the original overboard starring goldie hahn and kurt russell it's goldie hahn who's the um, rich one who gets amnesia after literally falling overboard and it's Kurt Russell who's more of the blue collar guy who convinces her that she's his wife but I haven't seen the original overboard I'm just telling you what I know but what I can tell you is that the remake of overboard is pretty good and I do recommend it especially for a rental I gave it my rating of a checkout when it um when i first saw it but it's it's out on dvd and blu-ray not sure about streaming but it's probably available on amazon prime as well so check it out if you can another movie that's coming out on 
DVD and Blu-ray today is one called Tully, which I saw a couple of months ago. I was really impressed with this film. It is a dark comedy from director Jason Reitman and screenwriter Diablo Cody, and it stars Charlize Theron. And I said this before in my previous review of it, but I'll say it again, that even though this is a movie that stars Charlize Theron, is directed by Jason Reitman, and written by Diablo Cody, it's actually not a sequel to Young Adult, which starred the same woman, directed by the same guy, and written by the same woman. It's an entirely different movie altogether. Whether or not it takes place in the same cinematic universe, I doubt it, but it's a movie about modern parenthood, and it's about Charlize Theron having had her third child, and of course she's had she has postpartum depression, as well as the stress of raising her newborn baby as well as raising her other two kids one of whom is developmentally delayed and eventually she hires a a night nanny whose name is tully and she's played by Mackenzie davis in another groundbreaking role and i was especially impressed by charlie theron in this movie i think if you guys see this movie you'll probably like it and again it's out on dvd and blu-ray probably on amazon streaming it might be a little while before it reaches netflix or hulu or any other streaming service but it is out right now and i recommend you check it out another film that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray today is Dark Crimes. And this is a movie I included on my list of what's coming out next, which is my my end of show segment where I give you a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. But Dark Crimes, which is a movie that stars Jim Carrey, yes, that Jim Carrey, is a film that must have been released in very limited release because even though I remember saying that this film might be coming out in theater near you. It didn't end up coming out in theaters in Boston, or at least not the ones that I frequent. But it's a movie that stars Jim Carrey and Charlotte Gainsbourg, and it's one of Jim Carrey's dramas. And it's a gritty thriller about a cop who unravels crimes, mirroring the plot of a book by a famed writer. And this movie, Dark Crimes, is based upon the 2008 True Crime Exposé by David Gran. Uh, it looks like a very interesting premise. Uh, Jim Carrey has been kind of hit or miss in dramas. Of course, his better films, his better dramas have included The Truman Show, which had more funny parts than I anticipated, but his misses have included The Number 23, which was just so serious it was ridiculous. But in any event, Dark Crimes is out on DVD and Blu-ray and possibly streaming today, so I recommend well I, I can't exactly recommend it because it hasn't come out yet or at least i haven't seen it but i would probably check it out if i were renting films but of course i have a very busy schedule and the other films that are the, the other things that are coming out on dvd and blu-ray today are a lot of reissues like for instance the 1990 comedy mr destiny starring jim belushi is is coming out on blu-ray today apparently it's its first blu-ray release and mr destiny was actually the the movie family man before Family Man, years before Family Man. Uh, Family Man was the 2000 movie starring Nicolas Cage where he was a wealthy businessman who gets transported to an alternate universe where he actually marries the girl he left behind and is living a middle-class existence. Mr. Destiny, starring Jim Belushi, is about a lower-middle-class guy who... who is transported to an alternate universe where he's actually very wealthy and successful. It, yeah, it kind of takes on the It's a Wonderful Life vibe, but it's actually funnier and more original than I anticipated. And I saw this years after it premiered, and it co-stars a number of noteworthy actors, including Linda Hamilton, before Terminator 2, but after the original Terminator, Michael Caine, Rene Russo, a, a completely unknown Courtney Cox, John Lovitz is in the movie as well. And this is a movie I'm convinced you could probably find on some streaming service. But if you're so inclined to see it on Blu-ray, if you have a Blu-ray player, it's, it's available today. And I recommend you check it out. But I think it's probably more a DVD movie. Just saying. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I'd like kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I think it's time to head back in. Okay. 
Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blow. <laughs> Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpacked Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I have completely run out of movies to give you, well, not only reviews for, but also movies that are coming out on DVD. I basically was hoping that would carry me into the next segment, but it hasn't. So instead, I'm going to give you my early segment, What's Coming Out Next. That's usually a segment I save for last, but I really don't have anything. But fortunately, the good news is that there are are a number of noteworthy films that are coming out this coming weekend and I'm not going to be in a rush to tell you about all of them. So, the biggest movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is the movie Christopher Robin. And this is about a working class family man by the name of Christopher Robin who encounters his childhood friend Winnie the Pooh who helps him to rediscover the joys of life. Now, this is a live action film with CGI animated characters and as much as I try Try to avoid watching movie previews with a passion. I did actually catch a glimpse of what the Winnie the Pooh characters look like in this film. And from what I can see, it actually looks like uh, a pretty good... It, it looks like the characters are animated very well. Um, if you'll just excuse me, i got to look something up. Um, but in, in any event... The, yeah, it, it's sort of a mix between the classic Winnie the Pooh characters as A.A. A. Milne uh, originally wrote them, as well as a little bit more of the familiar shapes of the Walt Disney characters that kids probably know better today than the A.A. A. Milne books. But, of course, I saw the Walt Disney version of Winnie the Pooh before I read the Winnie the Pooh books by A.A. A. Milne. And <laughs> I'm sure I'm definitely not the only millennial who can make that claim as well. But this is a little bit controversial because it is another live-action remake of a beloved Walt Disney classic. But actually, I don't think it's a remake. I think it's actually more of a sequel to Walt Disney's Winnie the Pooh than it is a remake. It's almost kind of doing for Winnie the Pooh what the movie Hook did for Peter Pan. And Hook has become a modern classic. I didn't think it was a perfect movie, but I, I certainly thought it was enjoyable. And Christopher Robin, whether I like it or hate it, it's a movie I will see this coming weekend, and I'll let you know what I think about it for next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters right now, or this coming weekend, is one called The Darkest Mind. And this is a movie that I'm not entirely familiar with. I'm not, excuse me, The Darkest Minds. It is based upon a novel by Alexandra Bracken, which I haven't read. But if it's coming out in theaters in just a couple of days, I might just sit down and read the book. But this is a dystopian movie about a group of teens who, imprisoned by an adult world that now fears everyone under 18, form a resistance group to fight back and reclaim control of their future. The movie stars Bradley Whitford, Mandy Moore, Amanda Stenberg, and Gwendolyn Christie, amongst other people. This movie kind of looks like one of those young adult novels like The Hunger Games or, um, well, something like that, or maybe The Maze Runner. And... It's a movie I might actually check out. I'll try to read the book first as I try to um, do that before I see a movie I know is based on a book, but I don't always succeed. But The Darkest Mind is, is out in theaters right now. 
Either way, I think I, this is a movie I probably will review for you for next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters that I definitely will review for you for next week's show is one called The Spy Who Dumped Me, which, of course, is a parody of the... Or at least in terms of the title, it's a parody of The Spy Who Loved Me, which is the classic Roger Moore, James Bond movie. But this movie, The Spy Who Dumped Me, is about two friends, Audrey and Morgan, who unwittingly become entangled in an international conspiracy when one of the women discovers the boyfriend who dumped her was actually a spy. So this movie stars Mila Kunis and Kate McKinnon, the latter of whom is one of the top five funniest women on SNL in the show's history. I think it's her, Kristen Wiig, Gilda Radner, Jan Hooks, and uh, I'll think of the other one a little bit later. Maybe A.D. Bryant I'll throw in there. But Kate McKinnon is very funny on SNL. I really hope that she, along with A.D. Bryant, Cecily Strong, Sashir Zameda, and Leslie Jones, do not disappear after their time at SNL is up. I hope they have an illustrious career that's more like Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, or Kristen Wiig than than the careers, the post-SNL careers of Gilda Radner and Jan Hooks, which didn't really last very long after SNL. But if The Spy Who Dumped Me is good, uh, Kate McKinnon might have an illustrious movie career after SNL, or maybe even a TV career. But either way, The Spy Who Dumped Me is a movie I definitely will see, and I'll let you know what I think about it come next week's show. And the other movie that's coming out in uh, nationwide is a movie called Death of a Nation. And this is a movie that's directed by Dinesh D'Souza and stars Dinesh D'Souza, who is the controversial conservative journalist, if you want to call him that, he's more like a commentator, and filmmaker, who is kind of like the Michael Moore of the right except that his movies have not na- made nearly as much money as Michael Moore's have however one of his documentaries which was 2016 which envisioned a world which, where 2016 was a terrible year because of Barack Obama made 30 million dollars on a 10 million dollar budget however the movie was eh, sort of pseudo prophetic 2016 was a bad year, but it wasn't because of Barack Obama that it was a bad year. Maybe I'm letting my politics bleed in there, but I am saying that it was not a bad year because of Barack Obama. But anyway, Death of a Nation is a documentary that draws parallels between Abraham Lincoln's presidency and the presidency of Donald Trump. Reading that scenario just makes me want to laugh out loud already. Again, I try not to be political, but this is a perfect time to remind you that the views and opinions expressed on this show words on film are solely those of yours truly your host and movie critic dan burke they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of anybody any employees who are who work at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole so please remember that but death of a nation is a movie i will probably see i don't i hope i don't have to pay money to see it but if it's coming out in the theater near me i will let you know what i think when i review it for next week's show i'm a 40 year old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma it's a little very hard for me but miss araceli she gave me direction at age 47 marco finished his high school diploma 50 percent of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors the other 50 percent is doing the work no one gets a diploma alone if you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma you have help find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org that's finishyourdiploma.org brought to you by the dollar general literacy foundation and the ad council every tuesday at three something special happens on boston free radio why it's toppers with your host Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot com. Toppers. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing with my segment of What's Coming Up Next, which is usually my very last segment. But because I only reviewed three movies this past week, it's actually sort of an extension. But the good news is that there are a lot of films to let you know about that are coming out or might be coming out in theaters near you this coming weekend. One of them is the nationwide expansion of 8th grade. And I can attest to this film. I have already reviewed it. I actually reviewed it for my show last week. And it's a movie that's directed by Bo Burnham. And it's about an introverted teenage girl who tries to survive the last week of her disastrous 8th grade year before leaving to start high school. This movie is amazing. It's one of my favorite films of the year so far. It's directed by and written by Bo Burnham and stars Elsie Fisher, Josh Hamilton, and a couple of other people. But largely unknowns in this film. But I highly recommend this film. I've already reviewed it as I said. It is a knockout. See this movie if it's out in a theater near you. If you are in junior high now or you have been in junior high years past and you absolutely hated it, you're going to love this film. I guarantee you. I, I don't want to build it up too much, but my God, I love this film. So, that's going into theaters nationwide. There are a couple of other films that are coming out in theaters in limited release. One of them is The Miseducation of Cameron Post. And this is a movie that takes place in 1993, when it was okay to be homophobic. And it's about a teenage girl who's played by Chloe Grace Moretz, who is probably going to play a teenage girl until she's 30, I'm, I'm guessing. But she is forced into a gay conversion therapy center by her conservative guardians. Now, if this sounds like the plot to the movie But I'm a Cheerleader, which stars Natasha Lyonne, it is the same plot, but that movie was a tongue-in-cheek comedy and a satire of gay conversion therapy. This is a drama and, and a romance as well, which probably means that eh, Chloe Grace Moretz, as a lesbian in this film, falls in love with somebody inevitably in gay conversion therapy. But I hope this movie ho hammers home better than uh, But I'm a Cheerleader did, how ridiculous gay conversion therapy actually is and how it's pretty much impossible to do. And it, I, I don't even know what the success rate is. It, it's, it's probably a success rate that is in denial. But in any event, The Miseducation of Cameron Post, it's a movie I hope is coming to a theater near me, but I can't guarantee it. But if it is coming out in a theater near me, I will try to see it and I'll let you know what I think about it next week. Another movie that's coming out in limited release is a movie called Never Going Back, and it's Going, G-O-I-N apostrophe, and it's about these two girls named Jessica, or Jesse and Angela, who are high school dropouts and are taking a week off, from what I don't know, to chill at the beach. Too bad their house got robbed, rent's due, and they're about to get fired, and they're broke. <laughs> Sounds like an interesting premise. The teenage girls in this movie are played by Maya Mitchell and Camila Marone, um, neither of whom I know, but Kyle Mooney from Saturday Night Live, who is in a great underrated film last year called Brigsby Bear, co-stars in this film. And I wish more people c could see or have seen Brigsby Bear, but... Anyway, Never Going Back is in limited release. I can't guarantee whether or not this film is going to come out in the theater near me, but if it does, I'll let you know what I think about it next week. Another film that might be coming out in theaters nationwide, but probably in, in art house cinemas, is, once, in, is a movie that's called Nico 1988. Now, who is Nico? Nico is a woman who was a singer for The Velvet Underground. What happened in 1988? Well, that was the year she died. And this is a bi this is a biopic about um, Nico as she tours and grapples with addiction and personal demons. I think very much like Edie Sedgwick and a couple of other women, Nico was initially amused for Andy Warhol, but once those muse days were over, Andy Warhol kind of discarded her. Andy Warhol tended to do that, and it, it's really unfortunate, but. Then again, Nico was a big deal for quite some time, especially when she was the lead singer of the Velvet Underground. And this is a movie that certainly looks interesting. It's not a documentary, but it is a biopic. And I will seek this movie out. It's actually opening on August 1st, which is Wednesday. And if it's coming out in the theater near me, I might see it. But... 
But that just about does it with Words on Film for this week's show. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, having a great time discussing movies as usual. And just a reminder, not only is Words on Film the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, but also, as I said in the previous segment the the views and opinions expressed on words on film about movies or otherwise that is about everything are solely those of your host and movie critic dan burke that's me of course they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast whatever that station may be or the station as a whole and just as another reminder you've been listening to words on film on boston free radio and wbca watching words on film on scat v or some community access tv station that's kind enough to pick up this broadcast or on facebook live either on my own personal page or on boston free radio's facebook page and this is dan burke saying i'll see you at the movies